Hey, if you guys could do me a big favor and pretend it doesn't look like I just tried to shave with the blunt end of a butter knife, I'd much appreciate it. Let's get on with today's episodes then, shall we? Hold it. Hold it. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. We start in Las Vegas, where a couple has just arrived for vacation. The wife, Flora, is thrilled to be there, whereas Frank, her husband, looks like he'd be having a better time changing a colostomy bag. Frank, you see, thinks Vegas is an irredeemable den of sin, but he's agreed to take his wife there since she won a contest that gave them three full days, all expenses paid. I mean, Vegas is a den of sin, that's why it's so much fun. I'm betting Flora knew how to party when she was younger, but old Frank, why, he wouldn't know fun if it was bouncing on his lap like a kangaroo on a pogo stick. The room is filled with slots. The machines, I mean. And Flora wants to try one after she sees another woman win a whopping $1,000, which nowadays would get you about three cocktails in a typical Vegas casino. Flora sticks a nickel in the machine, only to get verbally abused by her husband about throwing money away. What did he expect? I mean, really, what did he think they were going to be doing in Las Vegas, reading scripture in the lounge? Since the nickel is already in the machine, Frank eventually lets his wife have one turn at the dials, which predictably wins nothing. Satisfied that he's squashed any fun that Flora could have had, he heads back to his room, only to be accosted by your typical casino patron. This drunken monkey, rather than relying on simple peer pressure, physically forces Frank to put a dollar into a slot machine and then walks away. With nothing to lose, Frank pulls the one-armed bandit, and after winning about ten bucks, experiences the first dopamine hit of his sad, decaffeinated life. Frank decides to hoard his winnings back in the room, but as the couple walks away, he hears something odd calling his name. That night, as he stares confusedly at the ceiling, he continues hearing his name and realizes it's coming from the stack of silver dollars on the dresser. Spend I'm not listening! He gets up, takes the money, and when his wife wakes up, he offers a totally convincing excuse to go back to the casino floor and put the coins back in the machine. If there's one thing I know, Flora, it's morality. And I will not have this tainted money smelling up our pockets. Fast forward a few hours, and Flora goes downstairs to find Frank still feeding the machine, cashing multiple checks and spending a bunch of their savings. Flora tries to talk him down from his gambling binge, but he responds by yelling at her and making a scene. Flora, will you kindly shut your mouth? The floor staff marvel at how quickly Frank has turned into a junkie, but they of course make no efforts to stop him. You know, I get it. I was in Vegas on my honeymoon when I won a couple hundred bucks of the penny slots using nothing but pocket change. I don't remember much after that, but I woke up three years later in a French alleyway with a baguette tattooed on my leg and a very sore bottom. One lengthy montage later, and Franklin has gotten so exhausted that he starts to babble like a mental patient. Ten thousand dollars. She's bound to... To turn up in a little while, you... Frank starts anthropomorphizing the slot machine, convinced he'll win the jackpot eventually, as long as he never stops. Then, with what I can only imagine is his 18th last dollar, the slot machine jams and Frank treats it like a pimp. Frank! Give me back one dollar! Flora tries to get Frank to go to sleep that night, but Frank keeps hearing the slot machine call his name. In a frenzied state, Frank then sees the slot machine barge into the room. Yeah, it's as silly as it sounds, but I'm pretty sure it's intentional. I mean, the slot machine is smiling. So you see, that's where the trouble began. That smile. That damn smile. Franklin totally flips out the window, leaving poor Flora in despair. 
As the old man lies dead on the ground, a stray dollar finds its way to him as the slot machine looks on. This episode is basically just an after-school special about the dangers of gambling, but I can't help but like it. It barely feels like a Twilight Zone episode, but it does capture the mood of something I think most of us can relate to, that insidious madness we call addiction. But rather than being preachy about it, it feels more like a mockery of uptight morality, like this can only happen to somebody as hopelessly repressed as old Franklin. If there's a real lesson to take away from it, it's not about gambling per se. It's actually taken from Flora's perspective. Never marry a Frank. It's a miserable, terrible waste of time. Gee, we ought to do something, Fred. Okay. How's about taking a nap? I, I got a better idea. Let's take a Winston break. That's it. Winston is the one filter cigarette that delivers flavor 20 times a pack. Winston's got that filter blend. Yeah, Fred. In the skies above France, British World War I pilot Lieutenant Decker has gotten lost. He lands at a U.S. airbase, only to find himself transported 42 years into the future. Psh, what a poser. Buck Rogers went way further than that. The American officer who greets him on the tarmac, Major Wilson, asks if he's French. Which makes sense, given that Decker's wearing a white flag as a scarf. Inside the base, Wilson takes Decker to meet Major General George Harper. Oh, what is this? What is this? Harper grills him for answers, leaving both men completely perplexed. It isn't until Major Wilson chimes in and asks Decker what year he thinks it is that they finally start to consider the possibility that Decker has traveled in time. Naturally, the general doesn't buy it, convinced it's an elaborate joke at best and a bizarre attempt at espionage at worst. It turns out that the base is about to be visited by Air Vice Marshal Mackay of the RAF, who, in 1917, was Decker's commander in the Royal Flying Corps. Decker is put in a holding while the other two men go through his effects and discuss the situation. Wilson is more receptive to the possibility that Decker is telling the truth, but Harper is convinced it has to be a hoax, no matter how apparently accurate and detailed the ruse happens to be. Harper angrily stows Decker's stuff in an envelope in his desk and excuses Wilson. Then Wilson goes to visit Decker and asks if he's afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of anything. Engaging in some light interrogation techniques, Wilson discovers mission-critical information about the Air Vice Marshal, that he was once shot in the backside and the men used to call him Old Leadbottom which was preferable to his other nickname, Commander Flackass. Decker also says that he was on patrol with Mackay when they were ambushed by a group of German fighters, and that Decker was convinced the commander was killed in the attack. Wilson argues that it's impossible, because Mackay is a two-time war hero responsible for saving hundreds, if not thousands, of lives. Upon hearing this, Decker attempts to run, but Wilson catches him. Finally, the pilot confesses the truth. What are you? I'm a coward! I'm a coward! Decker was fleeing the same dogfight he was talking about when he was transported to the future. He left Mackay to die in order to save his own skin. But now, knowing the good Mackay was going to do, Decker wants to go back to get a second chance so he can save not just the one man he left to die, but also the legions of lives Mackay would go on to save. Basically, he's Yar from that episode of Next Generation where Guinan tells her she's supposed to be dead and so she goes back in time to save yesterday's Enterprise. That episode had a catchy name too, but I can't remember it. Decker gives a lengthy and emotionally powerful speech about being a coward, and though Wilson is capable of sympathizing, knowing that every soldier faces cowardice, he still won't let Decker go. So, more determined than ever, Decker lives up to his name and makes a run for it. By the standards of popular fiction, I can buy that he knocks the Major out with a blow to the head, but how does he knock out the guard by punching him in the stomach? Turns out the base is prepared for anything, except a single British man in an anachronistic uniform running foppishly towards a pathetic little prop plane. Wilson catches up to him and points a gun at his head, Fire! 
I'd rather die. But Decker still manages to get in the air. After that, nobody at the base considers using one of the several dozen modern aircrafts at their disposal to easily catch up to him before he vanishes in the clouds. I know the plot needs it to happen, but come on. Later, as General Harper is giving Wilson a thorough dressing down, Air Vice Marshal Mackay arrives. Risking the ire of the General, Wilson immediately begins asking Mackay about Decker and what happened 42 years ago. Mackay explains that things happened exactly as Decker had described, only after he fled, Decker came back and died a hero's death to save Mackay's life. The General then gives over Decker's effects and promises to explain everything, but not before the Major calls him Old Leadbottom. What did you call me? This is another classic Twilight Zone episode, and another one that was written by Richard Matheson. You guys know I love a good time travel yarn, and this fits the bill. It also does a good job believably putting a British pilot from 1917 into a U.S. airbase in 1959. It's a simple bit of magical realism, the kind of thing this show excels at, where you just put one unexplained plot device to mix things up and see where the story goes from there. And that's all I have on The Fever and The Last Flight. Now, as always, do all those YouTube-y things and check out my Patreon! And all that other good stuff. But until next time, this is the Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love. As long as you're not hurting anybody. <laughs>